Hello friends and subscribers, a very warm welcome back to my YouTube channel. This is Daniel Rosal bringing you uh, today's video from Jerusalem in Israel against the backdrop of the ongoing military operation conducted by the Israel Defense Forces in the Gaza Strip, which has set itself the target of eradicating Hamas. And it's a very, very slow war that the IDF is, uh, is operating in Gaza uh, involving very careful movements of uh, forces to isolate the strip and a half, set up evacuation corridors, um, and then very, very methodically move through Gaza 100 metres by 100 metres as they're trying to disrupt the vast tunnel uh, infrastructure that Hamas has built and basically eliminate Hamas's uh, capabilities entirely. So while that's going on in the Gaza Strip, and now that this month has been, this war has been going on for a bit over a month, attention is finally starting to turn a little bit to what's going to happen afterwards. Now, regarding the practical details of what's going to happen afterwards, Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israeli Prime Minister, said a few days ago that Israel is going to plan to maintain an ongoing security presence in the Gaza Strip, which, to state the obvious, excludes a couple of other uh, scenarios that some people were thinking likely, one of which would be that the PA, the Palestinian Authority, which maintains autonomy over pockets of the West Bank, would be the uh, would that you know Israel would kind of forcibly bring them in to Gaza to maintain uh, law and order. Uh, another possibility was an international consortium uh, being set up, and that uh, is one possibility that I think has would probably enjoy very limited public support in Israel because if we just look at what's happening. <clears throat> excuse me, on the northern border with Hezbollah, where theoretically. Uh, the United Nations interim force in Lebanon or UNIFIL are supposed to be ensuring that the uh, land between the border and the Latani River is free of paramilitary activities and yet we're seeing daily barrages of rockets from Lebanon into Israel so they've clearly failed completely in that responsibility and the question is why on earth would Israel trust another UN organized international force and I think uh, that uh, they don't is the answer to that. So we're looking at what's going to happen next and we're also looking at how is the Israeli political uh, compass going to be re-architected by these changes. In other words, is this war going to prove to finally be the undoing of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and his very long-term rule over Israel or will uh, is will, will as he is Mr. Security, supposedly, um, if Israel prosecutes a successful war against Hamas, will that actually bolster his popularity? Both of these are credible scenarios. Now, the uh, research I'm going to be presenting today, I'm just doing this video so that it gets out to more people. It's not my research to be very, to state the obvious, I'm not a pollster, uh, but I think it's important research um, and that's why I'm making this video. It's conducted by the Israel Democracy Institute. Now, just a couple of notes here. Firstly, very importantly, because this is such a volatile situation between going on in the Gaza Strip, this polling was conducted between October 24th and 26th. And that is, I'm just looking at my uh, calendar over to the size here. We're actually, that's actually about two and a half weeks ago. And as we're, you know, a month and a few days into this war, that would have been just about in the first uh, couple of weeks of the war, right? The war broke out on the uh, 7th of October, so the 24th uh, would basically be it's been a little over two weeks. Now, it's realistic to think that this sentiment is going to be in a state of flux as the outcomes of the war change over time um, and etc. So uh, it was conducted by the, um, as I said, the Israel Democracy Institute. And just to give a little bit of information about them up on the screen here, uh, the IDI is an independent center of research and action dedicated to strengthening the foundations of Israeli democracy. I'm just moving something uh, from under my chair here. Um, and the IDI is kind of best known for critiquing. Uh, they were quite involved in the uh, commenting on the judicial reform a debate which is very very much be moved over to the side and as the name suggests um they're a sort of i think it's fair to say left-leaning think tank think tank which supports more robust democracy in israel and uh, with proper checks and balances and thus was i believe came out in opposition to the judicial reform plans if i got that wrong uh anyone is welcome to correct me the author, uh, lead author of this uh, research was Professor Tamar Herman. She is the academic director of the Viterbi Family Center for Public Opinion and Policy Research, and she's a senior fellow at the uh, at the IDI. Finally, let's get to the research itself. 
the Israeli voice index. And I'm just going to give a sort of gloss over this document, uh, pointing out the main findings, or at least that I think are interesting, written by Professor, uh, Professor Tamar Herman and Dr. Or Anabi. So this is the October 2023 um, edition of the Israeli Voice Index, and it shows that a significant majority of Jewish Israelis trust the heads of the IDF over Prime Minister Netanyahu. If elections were held today, a majority of Israelis, 55%, would vote for the same bloc they voted for in the last elections. So again, it was the caveat that this is now uh, two and a half weeks retrospective, this uh, data. Um, interesting to see that I have seen some figures saying that 70% of Likud voters, uh, those who voted for Likud as the party of Benjamin Netanyahu, would not vote for him. So there, the, uh, the kind of impression given was that Likud was abandoning Bibi. Um, nevertheless, it seems that most people, because it's important to understand that in the uh, political system we have in Israel, people vote um, according to a party and the party list has a leader. So this is a little bit different than other systems of uh, democracy, including the one I uh, grew up with in Ireland, in which uh, there, it's a constituency based um, system. There is no such thing really as constituencies in Israel. When there is a general national election for a Knesset, you go and you vote for a political party um, and that party has a list. So it's a different system. And my critique of the system would be that it prioritizes national issues. When you don't have a constituency, people in Ireland, where I grew up, often critique um, constituency based politics because, you know, the, the famous the famous example is a pothole. Some people call it pothole politics. You know, your local politician fixes a pothole and you vote for him. Stupid things like that. But that's a valid criticism. But at the same time, when you don't have any constituencies, there is a complete vacuum of responsibility. None of the members of the Knesset, Israel's parliament, who are supposedly representing the people, have account direct accountability to citizens. And I think that's very problematic. So anyway, that is the uh, number one finding. And just to talk about the sample size here, 602 Jew, Jewish Israelis and 151 Arab Israelis. So we're looking at a sample size here of 750. Uh, just to remind Israel's population is something like 10 million thereabouts. And I think that breakdown between Jewish and Arab Israelis is roughly proportionate to the general uh, representations of each group in uh, Israeli society. So here's uh, so some interesting comments, the national mood. In line with the findings of the war in Gaza surveys we've conducted since mid-October, which indicate a rise in optimism about the future of Israel, despite the severity of the current situation, this month's survey also found an increase in the share of optimists regarding both the future of democratic rule in Israel and the future of Israel's security. I just want to say that as a, as a sample size of one, talking about my own personal opinion, I very, very much feel this. The war currently going on is scary. It's scary because, firstly, there's a lot of Israeli troops in Gaza and we're seeing, uh, you know, more people being killed by the day. It's scary because of the growing anti-Semitism we're seeing around the world. There is, of course, legitimate criticism about whether Israel's operation is proportionate and whether the amount of civilian casualties are necessary. Um, but we're also seeing a lot of very frank anti-Semitism and that scares me uh, as someone who lives in Israel, so I'm not directly affected, but you know, there's, there is a whole world outside of Israel and some of the scenes we're seeing are uh, frightening for Jewish people, very frightening, especially those of us who have relevant relatives living in the Jewish diaspora. And we're also, another big cause of concern is what happens if Hezbollah open a front on the northern border with Lebanon. That's something that's very worrying. And a lot of people, I've seen speculation that that front could break open when uh, Hezbollah perceives Israel to be at its uh, most engaged in Gaza, in other words, the most resources piled in there, and then a northern front breaks out. None of this is known, this is all speculation, uh, but it is quite scary. But nevertheless, I have a feeling, just sort of a very much intrinsic belly hunch, that we're going to emerge from this better. We've already seen the divisions in Israeli society that were very, very polarized because of the judicial reform uh, proposals really just evaporate very quickly left and right are coming together to support this war effort um, by Israel. So uh, the optimism was higher among Jews than Arabs at 43 and 26% respectively, and uh, roughly the same figures regarding optimism for security. However, 
interestingly enough that within each of these two big demographic chunks Jews and Arabs there are differences of opinion in the Jewish sample only a minority of those who define themselves as on the left 23% or in the center are optimistic about the future of democratic rule so how are these two things existing in parallel the answer is that Israel is quite a right wing uh, society overall so although the majority uh, there is optimism in the society at large for the left and the center they're feeling less optimistic about the future of democratic uh, rule in Israel and likewise I think this is actually more important the picture is similar regarding the future of Israel's security 34% of the left 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 leaning voters being optimistic 40% in the center and on the right 52% which, by the way, is not immensely high, of course. <clears throat> it's a very slim majority, but um, it is a majority nevertheless. Next finding. <clears throat> Excuse me. A large majority of the public at 70% think that the disagreements between supporters and opponents of the government's judicial reforms influenced Hamas's decision to execute its attack plans at this time. That's quite interesting. So, you know, the, we've seen a lot of sloganeering here in Israel that, you know... Uh, that we're coming together and that, you know, it's strong to come together and that any division is weakness. And that motif, if you will, seems to enjoy quite widespread support in Israeli society with seven out of 10 Israelis believing that Hamas chose to pull the trigger. Now, it's kind of clear that these attacks were in the work for quite some time, um, but the actual, uh, suggesting that the actual date of execution may have been uh, moved forward as such. And again, this is the split between the left, the centre and the right. In as opposed to the previous finding, this one's actually quite consistent that across uh, the three major sort of branches of the Israeli political spectrum, um, at least 70% and on the right, 81% uh, blaming a lack of unity or attributing a lack of unity to the breakout of the conflict. Also regarding the question of um, blame, for October 7th. Clearly there was immense Israeli uh, military failures that went on with Hamas being able to seem seemingly relatively easily overcome the Israeli security uh, you know, positions on the Gaza border. Now there's been a big debate in Israel about um, who should take responsibility. It took Netanyahu a couple of weeks to finally admit some semblance of responsibility. Uh, but there has been a, another feeling, another motif to use that word, that this blame game should not be carried out um, while the war is being is going on. So 63% uh, of Israelis believing that any examination of the issues of responsibility for the failure of October 7th should be postponed until after the war. However, very large differences were found on this question between different political camps in the Jewish sample, with only half of those on the left in favour of postponing such an inquiry and two thirds in the center and more than three quarters in the right. So the left wingers are less in favor of the idea. You know, they're more or to reverse that. They're more in favor of having this uh, sort of um, I'm, I'm lapsing back into Irish political terminology by calling it a tribunal of inquiry, uh, because that's what uh, that's what these things are called in Ireland. But uh, in, in any event, whatever the name is here. And the left, uh, they want to kind of have it now and the right, the right wingers are 78% in favour of uh, after the war. Just running that one up. Who do you trust more to direct the war? We asked. Several media outlets have reported tensions between Netanyahu and the heads of the IDF regarding the war in Gaza and conducting the Northern Front against Hezbollah. Who do you trust more in these issues? Around half of the respondents in the total sample said that they had more trust in the head of the IDF and a quarter said they don't trust any of them. Uh, around one-fifth said they trust uh, Netanyahu and the IDF equally, 19% in the Jewish cohort, and only a tiny majority reported that they trust Netanyahu more. Okay, So we can see these figures um, broken down again according to the political bloc. And interestingly, very interestingly I would suggest, the we're seeing uh, left and centre being uh, more. You can see on the right it's kind of spread spread even a bit and on the left and the right as left and the center excuse me there is quite um quite strong majority support for having more faith in the idf than prime minister netanyahu um now what that means exactly i think is unclear right because 
the way they framed the question. Uh, the heads of the IDF regarding the war in Gaza and conducting the Northern Front. Several media outlets have reported tensions between Netanyahu and the heads of the IDF. It's unclear really, you know, who actually has the authority to conduct the war. I would have thought it is the IDF, but perhaps Netanyahu has a veto. So um, in any event, sim- asking, putting it in more simple terms of who do you think is more responsible, was more capable, we see a large uh, cohort on the left affirming that. Only a tiny majority of respondents rate the function functioning of government institutions regarding the evacuees and the home front as good or excellent, whereas around half rate their functioning satisfactory on the provision of essential services like electricity, food and water. How would you rate the functioning of government institutions since the beginning of the war and the following issues? So a quarter of a million Israelis have been internally displaced as a result of this war with the uh, Hamas in Gaza. And in terms of satisfaction with the government response, uh, to do the key here, green is poor to very poor. Um, interestingly, the most negativity is regarding Hasbara or Israel's PR efforts with 50% saying they're very poor. And But in terms of the more practical stuff like, you know, keeping education going and uh, electricity supply, the bare bone functioning of society, uh, more, uh, more favor. Rate the functioning of government institutions on the following issues as good or excellent. Uh, total sample by vote of the last elections and uh, coalition and opposition party voters. The respondents are divided. Next uh, next uh, subject here. Releasing Palestinian prisoners in exchange for the release of the Israeli hostages. The respondents were divided as to whether it would be right or wrong to release large numbers of Palestinian prisoners held in Israel in return for the release of the Israeli hostages held by Hamas, something something like 240 of them, with 43% sort of supporting such an exchange and 39% opposing it. So right now, um, and the rest selected don't know, right now it's about 40-40, give or take. Some saying there should be a prisoner release. Now the question is a prisoner release. If there were to be a prisoner release, you can imagine would be on a huge scale. When Gilad Shalit was held in Hamas captivity, that was a prisoner release. How? What would a prisoner release on 240 times Gilad Shalit? What would the Hamas demands be? Perhaps emptying out all the prisoners in the Israeli jails entirely. So uh, I would say not surprising that there is kind of um, opposition here. And we can see um, with the Israeli Arabs uh, were quite a little bit higher in their in their uh, support for this idea of a prisoner exchange with 60%. Uh, supporting it versus uh, only 40% in the Jewish cohort. And uh, drafting Haredim to the IDF, in light of a sizable number of young Haredim, ultra-Orthodox Jews, having requested to enlist in the IDF since October 7th, we sought to examine public opinion regarding the military drafting of Haredi men. Almost half of the Jewish respondents think that Haredim should be drafted in the same way as every other segment of the Jewish public. Uh, One third are in favor of exemptions so that they can study Torah. And only a small minority at 14% think that all Haredi men should be exempted from military service. Uh, So that is interesting. And they looked at it by a camp again, dividing Israeli society, a Jewish Jewish Israeli society between those who are Haredi themselves. And interestingly, within that cohort, 74% supporting an exemption, a blanket exemption for youngsters. So really the idea that Haredim uh, are, don't support um, the continued uh, Torah-based exemptions is really a fallacy because in this cohort, seven out of 10 of them do. Of course, that means there are three out of, three out of 10 don't, but um, quite a strong support for it. And pretty much inverse when you look at secular, 66% say dr- the Haredi should be drafted just like anyone else. And the support for the exemption is tiny. I have to hover over it to see it. It's 1.5% of seculars. The war in relations between Jews and Arabs in Israel. We asked, how would you characterize relations between Jews and Arabs, citizens of uh, citizens of Israel today? Very good, good, so, so bad, or very bad. An interesting finding and one that requires further investigation was a decline in the share of Jewish respondents who said that relations are bad 
relative to the previous measurement and a slight rise in the share of those who said they're good. And again, this is kind of uh, reflective of really what we're seeing in Israeli society, at least as the media is portraying it, that we're seeing uh, or we, we have been seeing some quite uh, clear opposition. And we've seen, of course, Israeli Arabs uh, dying tragically in this conflict, both those in the army and uh, those not in the army, because the Hamas terrorists on October 7th and when they're firing missiles did not distinguish between religion whatsoever. So this is, I would say, a heartening finding. Um, we can see on the 10th, Jews, very good, 11% rising on 8 so, so. Now, it's important to really state that across both the Jewish and, and Arab demographics, the uh, most common opinion is so-so. And the good slash very good, interestingly, is actually higher among the Arab demographic. And this is going all the way back to 2017. Um, so although there has been a rise in sort of the optimism, there's actually been a de decline in the Arab sector from those who rate the relations as good to very good from 33 to 21%. On the flip side, the Jews have been increased, but overall across both Jews and, Jews and Arabs, the most dominant opinion is that relations are so-so. Voting intentions in future elections, despite the extensive criticism of the government voiced since the outbreak of the war, particularly the prime minister, uh, only a tiny minority, 6% of the total sample, said that if elections were held in the foreseeable future, they would vote for a party in the, in the opposing bloc from the one they voted for at the last elections. So it doesn't seem like yet this uh, election is going to turn uh, the tables on the Israeli political uh, spectrum. Just uh, want to bring up the source data as well here. I'm just going to make myself a little bit smaller. And then I'll stop because this is a lot of data already. Uh, how do you feel about the state of democratic governance in Israel in the foreseeable future? Um, we can see a very optimistic um, Jews and Arabs uh, averaging out to uh, 11%. How do you feel about uh, Israel's security situation in the foreseeable future? Good deal of moderate optimism, more so on the side of the of the Jews. And uh, other surveys uh, finding us to the state of education and everything else we saw. I'll put a link in the description uh, to this particular uh, lengthy page from the IDI. Again, it was a bit retrospective, but I hope this has been interesting for those who are curious to see what kind of trends are emerging in Israeli uh, civil society as a result of this conflict. Thanks for watching today's video. And if you want to get more videos from me, do consider subscribing to this YouTube channel.